Um, Melanie, I invite you uh, uh, up here. I will close my windows to make this cleaner. Um, and Melanie will talk for around 45 minutes. Then we have uh, time for questions afterwards. And then comes the promised 30 minute break. Thank you for coming out. I heard yesterday was great, so I hope you're not too hungover. Um, and yes, I prepared a little presentation. And this is the end of it. First of all, thank you so much, Maike, and thank you so much, Jorinde, for inviting me. It's an amazing program that you put together, and I'm just amazed by the sheer volume of great speakers and great people that you have achieved to bring to Amsterdam for these four days. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. So what I will do today is I will draw on my uh, current curatorial pro project called Inflected Objects, um, which is a research project and an ex exhibition series. I will discuss the concept of autonomy as part of contemporary artistic production in my talk today. Not in the traditional sense of autonomous versus applied art, ivory tower versus integrated in society, but autonomous in the sense of doing your own thing. I will argue that the accelerated uh, circulation of content and abstracted processes have reached a situation in which data, images, objects spiral away from our reach. We cannot grasp their dynamics anymore as their influence leak, leaks out in too many direction, directions. They create mechanis mechanisms of their own, trails that cannot be anticipated. Um, I will thus talk first about circulation and abstraction, two concepts that I deem essential for the current situation. By elaborating these two concepts, I will describe how the globalized technological infrastructure has created a setting in which the status of the object is increasingly hard to pin down. Thereafter, um, I will relate this to current philosophical thinkies, thinking theories that have been much talked about under the rubric of object-oriented ontology mostly, and uh, I will refer to theories uh, from uh, Graham Harmon, Jane Bennett, and Stephen Shaviro. After this conceptual and more theoretical um, introduction, I will present a few artistic practices that I will relate to these concepts by Mark Lecky, Juliette Bonovio, Dan Walwin, Femke Hirgrafe, and if time allows, also David Horwitz and Nina Bayer. The first topic, circulation. Network technologies have introduced an unprecedented speed and ease for the circulation of content and objects. Things are in constant transit, an endless flow of objects circulating through the infrastructures of a globalized world. Circulation is essential to the workings of capitalism as value is created through movement. This is not only true for consumer goods, but also for abstract, symbolic, and informational objects. Photographs, Twitter messages, brands, and memes need to be spread, liked, and tagged to accrue value. Assets traded in exchange to accumulate profits. Now that Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are instantly and constantly available, the speed with which uh, information circulates has further intensified, and it has be become increasingly hard and difficult to withdraw from this process. Art is part of this economy of attention. In, to in today's hyper-networked era, we are becoming used to seeing and experiencing artworks online. We encounter them as so many images, 
in the various feeds we, we scroll through, our fingers touching the screen and our eyes quickly scanning its content. The value of an artwork, its ability to attract attention or eyeballs to use tech lingo and to become important lies in its agility, in its capacity to adapt to various contexts. In 1953, Theodor Adorno wrote what is called Austerity is the afterlife of the artwork. It lies in the artifact's capacity for disintegration. With the current media culture as a backdrop, this disintegration becomes more pronounced as contexts collapse and images are easy to manipulate. Hybridize or disappear. Oliver Larik's um, line in his two 2013 video versions can be seen as the updated version of Adorno's statement and has become the imperative for images to stay alive. When I talk about uh, an artwork and its life, this includes different mediated stages. An artwork might be a sculpture made out of clay, but in my understanding, this artwork encompasses also the digital file that was created when uh, its photo was taken its image as it appears online, or in a book, or in any other medium. An artwork does is a sculpture, is a file, is an image, is, the, is data, is numbers, is code, can turn into a print, becomes an object framed on a wall, turns into code again, is a photograph, and so on. In this setting of constant movement and adaptation, we can no longer conceive of the artwork as a fixed entity. In After Art, his book that was published in 2013, the American art historian David Choslit makes a similar claim when he writes, the category medium needs to be discarded as it privileges discrete objects. The goal of after art is to expand the definition of art to embrace heterogeneous configurations of relationships or link, links. What the French artist Pierre Huge has called a dynamic chain that passes through different formats. Rather to, to think of an artwork as a fixed entity, Joselet does suggest to think of it as an emergent format. He writes, Formats are dynamic mechanisms for aggregating content. In mediums, a material substrate, substrate, such as paint on canvas, converges with an aesthetic tradition, such as painting. Ultimately, mediums lead to objects and thus reification. But formats are no nodal connections and differential fields. They channel an unpredictable array of ephemeral currents and charges. Uh, they are configurations of force rather than discrete objects. In short, formats establish a pattern of links, connections. To summarize this part on circulation, with the rise of the internet, the habitat of the art object has changed. The context of the digital image has become vast and turned into a space that is hard to oversee in which images move and circulate by being posted, liked, tagged, changed, adapted, reblocked, etc. Artworks that might have been conceived as sculptures turn into images, turn into Twitter messages, become part of newsletters, are reused as backdrops for Facebook profiles, etc. As such, they become networks rather than being concrete units. They take on a life of their own which cannot be controlled anymore. The artist Mark Lecky, whose work I will discuss later on in the um, talk in more detail, has described this as a new form of anxiety. In his words, people aren't sure about what an image or object is anymore. They're not sure how things are fixed or where they, where they belong. If something can be a JPEG online, what is it when you print it out and put it up in a gallery? Increasingly, there is this confusion, this anxiety about the status of things. There is a sense that the object and the subject 
are themselves just nodes or parts of a networks <coughs> of networks of understanding. And with that, I would like to come to my second topic, abstraction. Abstract processes are the backbone of our current digital society. Digi digitization is based on a binary system, building up information on the, on the bas basis of two symbols, zeros and ones. These fundamental bits then compose code, software, communication, images, social settings, and markets. Abstraction allows for complexity. We delegate tasks to systems in order to be able to do the things we do. Bruno Latour describes this in his text on technical mediation when he writes, it is by mistake or unfairness that our headline reads, man flies, Wo uh, woman goes to space. Flying is a property of the whole association of entities that includes airports and plane, launch pads and ticket counters, and one might add today, online booking and board computers. B-52s do not fly, the US Air Force flies. What Latour says here is that we are always embedded in a complex infrastructure of technology and things when we do the things we do. This interdependence has increased even more with an extending networked infrastructure. As more and more processes are digitized, our world is increasingly permeated by a calculative software-enabled um, infrastructures running silently in the background. As a result, we increasingly depend on these abstract processes that fly our airplanes, switch on traffic lights, and determine the value of the money in our bank accounts. As this technology uh, becomes more pervasive, there is more and more talk that ordinary objects, too, will be hooked up with sensors and monitors and machine-readable labels so that they may be remotely controlled through network technologies. In this way, all kinds of things can become carriers of digital signals, while the computer, to quote the architect and writer Keller Easterling, has left the box. Technologies enthusiastically enumerate the many possibilities of this development. A heart monitor implant talking to the central computer of a hospital informing about the patient's well-being. Streets with built-in sensors to switch the, the street lights on just in time when a car is approaching to save energy. Or a fridge that is able to order a new carton of milk just in time when the old runs out, etc., etc. As such, formerly innate objects come to life and show signs of agency producing and distributing information and reacting to their environment. Before letting all take over in light of these new developments, we need to remind ourselves that this process of assigning functions and tasks to objects and hence replacing human actions has, has been in place before the Internet of Things, in the sense that we have long, that objects have long helped us manage our lives and have long been stand-ins for our actions. Me projecting this presentation, for instance, with the help of this elaborate setting of tools is one example. Um, so objects and tools always ha had the power to do things, to be delegated tasks. Bruno Latour gives a, a compelling example of this when he talks about the speed bump that forces drivers to slow down. Previously, this task was performed by a policeman that would be present on the street to stop cars and to tell them to slow down. When a speed bump was built, this action shifted to an object, to a technique, and, would, and it scribed in itself in a concrete bump. Encountering such a speed bump on the campus of his university, Latour wrote that as such, um, and I quote here, 
an action long past of an actor long disappeared is still alive and acti uh, still active here today on me. I live in the midst of techni technical delegates. I rely on many delegated actions that themselves make me do things on behalf of others who are no longer here and that I have not elected and the course of whose existence I cannot even retrace. This enmeshment with our delegates has become complicated and complex. In the example of the speed bump, we can still retrace what kind of translation from a human actor has been deferred to a concrete material. These delegations have become so manifold, however, that in our, technology, in, in our technolo technologically saturated world, it is impossible to disconnect, to completely act on our own. Latulus writes accordingly, our delegation to action to other actants, and with actants he means a speed bump, for instance, or any object that helps us act, and that now share our human existence is so far progressed that a program of anti-fetishism could only lead us to a non-human world, a world before the mediation of artifacts, a world of baboons. Oops. Um, departing from this image of baboons, I would like to dwell a bit more on the current online situation. At least since the Web 2.0, meaning since the rise of platforms for user-generated content, such as YouTube, Wikipedia, Facebook, Twitter, etc., online culture has become interwoven with the hyper-capitalistic fabric of our society. Fast parts of the contemporary web are presently owned by a few uh, private mega company, as you see there are logos here on the screen, which capitalize on the content and data generated by the users of their platform, by us. Data exchange at a rapid pace is gathered, profiled, and put to work so that more products can be sold. Social media profiles have become commodities whose exchange value is measured in likes, social capital, and ultimately sold for hard cash. Never have we incorporated the logics of capital capitalism so intimately in our lives. Never have we been so unsure what kind of da data we produce and uh, where it will end up, who's making money with it, and for what reasons and purposes. That is, we as producers of content, but also just when you switch on our laptops, um, we produce data that is sold as commodities. As such, our data becomes a commodity, becomes a thing that um, gets sold. To summarize here too, digital infrastructures and network technologies have become extended. Their networks going well beyond the devices that we perceive as computer or computational devices. Our infrastructure and logistics rely on network technologies to which we delegate, as Bruno Latour says, more and more power to act. The tendency to give away agency is not only at work here, however, but also when it comes to our personal data. As we exteriorize more and more to our devices, it becomes increasingly unclear where this data ends up and what is being done with it. As Latour has shown, this delegation of agency is an inherent property of using tools. But since the levels of complexity of the systems that we are meshed with have increased, and we have no grip anymore over the complex algorithmic processes at work behind our devices, the sense that things work by themselves has grown. Increasingly, there's a feeling that processes once put in motion cannot be stopped anymore. With algorithms shifting through our data, it becomes more and more difficult to oversee who is in charge and what and where to draw a line between dumb objects and intelligent user, chatty bots and commodified online profile. 
These technological developments can be related to recent work uh, in philosophy that reassesses the status of the object, most notably Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology. One of the central claims in Harmon's th thought is that the object's reality or its truth far exceeds our knowledge or experience of it. He writes, the single error to be guarded against lies in the ingrained habit of regarding beings as present at hand, as rep representable in terms of delineable properties rather than acknowledged in the actus of being what they are. To reduce a thing to its present presence at hand is to reduce it to the correlation, to the relation that I have with the thing. This is also called, when you, when you read this, this text, this is often called correlationism. But a thing, according to Harmon, is more than the qualities we can grasp of it. It always exists and acts independently of and in excess over the particular ways that we can comprehend it. In other words, we can never fully grasp the essence of an object, as it, it always remains partly hidden to us. The object is there, but it's not there for us. This encounter is an aesthetic one. We can feel this quality rather than understanding it. Connecting these arguments um, to objects of art, it can be argued that this is precisely how artworks have always functioned. Um, and this is also why these theories might be so appealing to, to the visual arts. They seem to always be slightly out of reach, difficult to master, and they, uh, and they thrive on this very ambiguity. ambiguity, ambiguity sorry. Um, moreover, human object interactions are considered as just one special case within the more general uh, field of object-object relations. Many thinkers, related to the field of object-oriented ontology highlight the connections between objects as they similarly describe the objects that surround us as being part of a buzzing field of exchange, humming without our awareness. As such, the lines between living, non-living get, uh, re um, the lines between living and non-living get renegotiated. To do this, the American philosopher Jane Bennett has come up with the concept, concept of vital materialism, the, the idea that everything has lively properties. Life becomes a matter of degree rather than a category that stands in opposition um, to the non-living. In the introduction of her bo book, Vibrant Matter, that was released in 2010, Jane Bennett opposes the parsing of the world into dull matter on one side versus vibrant beings on the other. She writes, the quarantines of matter and life encourage us to ignore the vitality of matter and the lively power of material formations, such as the way omega-3 fatty acids can alter human moods or the way our trash is not away in landfills, but generating lively streams of chemicals and volatile winds of, of methane as we speak. To put it with uh, Stephen Shabiro, vitality is, is unevenly distributed, but it's at work everywhere. There are many intermediary inter um, forms between life and non-life, viruses, bots that talk to each other, hormones, and so on, and so on. To summarize this section too, recently a line of thought um, mostly talked about under the rubric of object-oriented ontology and speculative realism has increasingly focused on objects and things as entities that A, are more than the relation we have with them, B, can be seen as forms of lives as well. Lifeliness here becomes a matter of degree rather than being divided along the lines between life and death. Just 
check it. So now I would like to trace how these thoughts uh, can be connected to and have inspired um, artistic practices. To start off with probably the most um, famous and obvious example, I would like to mention the British, British artist Mark Leckie. How many of, know, of you know him or his work? Okay. Um, in many of his recent projects and works, he has addressed um, how objects might come to life, especially in relation to technology. This was also the case uh, in a touring exhibition that the artist conceived in 2013, entitled The, Un the Universal Addressability of Dumb Things. The exhibition in various, uh, was it, w toured through various venues in England in 2013, and parts of it um, were also exhibited as part of the 2012 um, Venice Biennial. It included works by various artists such as William Blake, Louis Bourgeois, Richard Hamilton, Nicola Hicks, and Andy Holden, next to historic objects, memorabilia, and other things. He arranged them uh, in different settings and groups of objects, as you see them here, uh, but also here. For instance, an enormous inflatable um, of Felix the Cat, which filled the height of the gallery. Um, and in front of this um, enormous puppet, plinths on which objects were positioned, such as a, can a, a canopy jar, a beeswax vase, or a tin of cat food. Lackey uh, fostered uh, relationships between objects that stem from very different times, but are believed to have some kind of power. As such, Lackey positioned a, a 13th uh, cent a, uh, sorry, a 13th century silver hand uh, reliquary, um, thought to contain the bones of a saint whose touch could bring spiritual healing alongside a state of the art bionic artificial hand. I think you see this on this picture. Uh, it's not very visible, but these two plinths with the black and silver thing in it, those were the two hands, sorry for the bad picture. Um, a similar connection was made by positioning the, car uh, the carved stone head singing gargoyle uh, from the 1200s that I will be talking about in the back of the installation. Side by side with the replica of William Blake's um, death mask with electrodes attached to it and a Cyberman helmet from Doctor Who. Sound, light and scenography, or, and scenography overall were important tools in these exhibitions. Um, one space, for instance, was darkened, that space that you see now. In this area, objects and artworks related to legendary monsters and science fiction fantasies, um, some of them glowing in ultraviolet light to which an electroacoustic soundtrack was played by the German artist Florian Hecke. Um, Lecky referred to this object as dumb since they are not able to move, in contrast to the things that he, that he encountered online in his computer. In a tour that the artist gave through the show that was recorded and uh, which, uh, which, of which the transcript I have um, typed up here, he said, I wonder why do, I wonder why do I, do you need to transpose images to a gallery, to the physical world? The question, I suppose, um, has an obvious answer. The things have qualities, a whatness, they have an aura. To be able to gain access to those things in flesh is exciting. Uh, it is to access their power. But they're also dumb in the sense that things in the computer have a life, an anima quality that those objects don't. Growing up with a TV and now having the internet at hand, like he said, he somehow how wanted to move the things he encountered. 
This actually started with another work of his, a series of sculptures that he blasted sound at, entitled Big Box Statue Action, as he called these installations. He performed this installation with a sculpture by uh, Jakob Epstein called Jacob and the Angel at Tate Britain in 2003, with a Henry Moore statue at the Serpentine Galleries in 2011, um, of which he said it didn't work really, really well because the statue was too thin, and also confronting uh, a Victorian steam engine in Manchester. Going back uh, to the Liverpool tour that Lecky gave um, through his exhibition, he goes on saying, technology uh, being seen as an alienated mechanism. It's not that I don't believe it, but I don't accept it. What I want to do with the work that I make is to fully embrace it, not in a kind of Stephen Fry iPhone way. Stephen Fry is an English actor who is very um, happy with the current, um, with our current devices, uh, but but allow um, this other nature of technology to become my nature. I want to be a cyborg. I want a total synthesis between me as an organic living thing and stuff that isn't. I guess that's what I was trying to do with the show. The real world, world world's objects. They're fixed and mutable, and beyond that, there are museum pieces. I can't physically touch them. I wanted this show to be quite theatrical and, re and a rewarding experience, but more that this allows me to get access to objects, and there's the opportunity to do things with them, make them become animated. They are no longer objects that sit there in dumb silence. So in relation to what I, I have previously elaborated, Lecky does not necessarily believe in these objects having an agency as such, but he believed in him acting as kind of like an internet of things, wiring uh, them up through his scenography by fostering relations, by putting them in specific light situation, etc. He wanted to bring them to life. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, thank you. Um, and there's this other work of his, but I'm not going to talk about this, but here he very explicitly relates to the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is often talked about in one specific example, the talking fridge, the fridge that is able to um, talk to a supermarket when, when uh, you run out of milk and lucky staged um, in a performance and also in a video piece that is available online that you can also access online, how um, such an inner life of a fridge might sound like, might look like. Um, his work was also influential for the exhibition that I curated most recently and that Maike also mentioned at the Halle in Harlem, in which I brought pieces from the collection of the museum back to life pieces that had, have often never been exhibited. Um, here too, I was interested in how the staging of these objects could foster new relations between them and, and us, and in creating an alluring space that wants to seduce you rather than convince you with the properties of a white cube. There is a lot more to say about this exhibition, uh, and you can also still see it at the Halle. But for now, I would like to leave it at that and to go to the next artist whose work I would like to present to you, um, the work of Dan Walwyn. Um, how many of you um, are familiar with, with the work of Dan? Great. <laughs> um, the work of Dan Walwyn, um, okay, sorry. In his installations, and this is very hard to bring across uh, through images, infrastructures become sentient, responsive, and alive. He creates these odd spatial settings that look strangely generic and thus familiar on one side, 
but also appear to be humming, recording, and generally giving off a vibe of strangeness and unease when encountering them. As such, these infrastructures ooze off a strange power. I read his work as an incarnation of the more and more abstracted infrastructures that loom around us, a kind of dreadful apocalypse of the status quo that I sketched in the beginning of my talk when I was talking about the infrastructures of abstraction. Walwin creates an environment in which abstracted infrastructures take center stage and become alive. Quite contrary, quite contrary to Lecky, here the lure is negative and oppressive. Technology becomes alien and the other instead of inviting and playful. This sense of entrapment and dominance uh, of an overpowering infrastructure that makes no difference between things, objects, data, and humans in its technological gaze is an aspect that also comes to the fore in a video piece Walwin Walvin made for the show. And I've brought this short piece. Okay, and I don't know why it's so, it should actually be more fluid, but I stop it here, but, uh, but it's a loop of this camera moving across this weird kind of setting of different things. Um, oops, sorry. Suggesting that a technologically mediated view of things, the video was filmed with a robotic arm, make, that makes, makes no distinction between personal memory and beer bottles, fences and bodies, grass and laminated words. Here, boundaries between subject and object become blurry as they're equally set on an equal plane, exposed to the same technologically mediated 
The third artist whose work I would like to present is the French artist uh, Juliette Bonoyot. Whereas uh, Walwyn's work rendered infrastructure sentinel and responsive, Bonoyot's work Bonne, 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 looks how the materials our bodies and objects are made of are connected. Her work has an explicit link to an understanding of materiality um, as being a life that I have briefly touched on up, upon when I talked about Jane Bennett's work in the beginning. I would like to look at a specific work series uh, the artist has worked um, on since 2015, entitled, entitled Xenoestrogens, a series of paintings that she painted with substances that contain xenoestrogens. Xenoestrogens uh, imitate the workings of the female sex hormone estrogen. They can be either sy uh, synthetic or natural chemical co compounds. The xeno part means that they come from the outside and are not produced in human bodies. Technically, though, they have the same effects as estrogens. Aligning herself with the thought of Jane Bennett, for Bonneville, material properties are alive as they travel through our foods, get discarded, end up in nature, and are fed, fed back to us. Materials contain movement. They go places and have effects that cannot be foreseen. Her work highlights this interconnectedness of a, on a material level, and also the fact that something so intimate to us as a female ho hormone, which makes reprodu reproduction and future life possible, is contained in all of these other materials as well that we normally regard as dead matter. To each of the paintings for which she uses one material that contains the hormone, she produces a list of the materials uh, and how the hormone is produced or part of it. I won't go into the details here, um, but um, this is all information you can access on her website as well. What I, ha uh, what I have tried to show so far is how Mark Leckie's work connects to object-oriented ontology and to Internet of Things, how the work of Dan Walwyn can be seen as making tangible and an ever-growing abstracted technological infrastructure and a technological gaze that makes no difference between objects, nature, and humans. Uh, as well as how the lines between life and death, natural and artificial, become increasingly fluid when looking at materiality in the work of Juliette Bonneville. Shall we stop here? You can do one more. Artist. I can do one more. <laughs> Great. So um, maybe you can choose which one I should present to you, um, because I saw that Femke Hirschhafe was in your program before. So. Shall I skip her and go to David Horvitz, or would you like me to talk about Femke? David. David? Okay. So I was going to talk about Femke's work um, on algorithmic trading um, as a form, as kind of like these, these financial um, algorithms that spiral out of our reach and cannot control anymore. And, then they do all kinds of stuff that um, are not foreseeable uh, with money, which is actually quite scary. And she has done this extended research on these processes and um, has then also created this sculptural um, series of work. But now to David Horwitz. Hor um, Horwitz. Boop, boop, boop. What about Nina? Nina? <laughs> What do you say? Wasn't there one more? Was there was one more, yeah. Shall I go to David first and then we see the time and otherwise uh, I can also talk to you directly about Nina. Um, so let me see. So David um, is an artist who questions the aspect of circulation that I mentioned in the beginning and the fact that the context for this circulation has become so vast that it cannot be overseen anymore. 
Um, he has repeatedly questioned the role of platforms such as Wikipedia in his work and the way images are distributed most recently in his work, Mood Disorder. Inspired by Bas Jan Adars, I'm, I'm too sad to tell you, uh, a work that you can watch on YouTube. Um, Mood Disorder is a stock image made by David Horowitz of himself to look like a typical um, stock image of depression. Um, this is the original image. Um, he then <coughs> uploaded the image to, uh, his, uh, to, to the Wikipedia page for mood disorder, after which it became copyright free and began to be used as a free stock image um, for depression on cheap websites all over the web. Such as this. Mm -hmm. This. and many more. This work shows how this particular image travels and how much the Wikipedia page, where it initially comes from, actually influences where it ends up. It shows the potential for endless use, but it also shows how platforms such as Wikipedia influence the connotations that an image has, besides the fact how widely it is actually used. This artwork, to me, then exemplifies a point that David Choslit made when he defines artworks as an extending structure whose properties have the potential to end up in all kinds of contexts. Um, and with that, I think I would come to an end. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions for Melanie? I thank you. Oh. I don't see any hands. No. Um, I was wondering, Melanie, if yeah. you, um, it's a very rich presentation. Thank you so much for all the, the connections you draw between different artistic practices and ways of thinking. Um, and I was wondering how you personally uh, navigate through the world. How do you look at objects and things? Do you see them as part of a, a larger um, network? Um, Sorry. Um, uh, I asked Melanie how, how she um, walks through life, how she looks at objects and things, and whether for her, uh, by being so immersed in this theory and uh, thinking about um, agency uh, and objects, uh, whether that changes her view on things, uh, and whether maybe it makes you a bit more gentle when you close the door, or whether you still <laughs> kick the fridge and, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's easy to because we need to function in everyday life, so things need to behave according to, um, to the behavior we want them to do. So in many ways, um, our ways we act with things are very instrumental, and they need to be because we need to function, we have, uh, we have deadlines, we are under time pressure. But um, reading through this theory and also through my work at like working with, at the, at, um, with the collection at the Franz Hals Museum, the Halle, made me realize that there is so much care devoted to objects. There is so much, um, there are so many artists who have worked before us and who have worked with, with matter and stuff um, uh, in previous times. And uh, when I looked at the, at the collection there, it made me realize that, first of all, many ideas come back. Second of all, the amount of stuff that has been produced is insane. Um, and it made me, and I felt very strongly that before producing something else, we should maybe look at the things that are already there. So maybe this is not a, a direct answer to what you said, but since it's such a broad question, I just picked 
kind of like the aspect of maybe going back to things rather than um, then like extending the life cycles of objects. And also, and that is also true for me that I try to be more um, careful with what I buy. And I try to, also with technological things, I try to kind of like not go new all the time because I think it's ridiculous. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. That, that makes sense. I mean, I think mm. care is a beautiful uh, concept when um, rethinking our relationship to objects and things, uh, as well as other um, non-human but living uh, things around us. Um, are there any questions at this moment? I also wanted to say, if you have any questions, that it's a large room and I get that asking questions is always scary in those settings. So I'm around, um, I will be around during the breaks and I will also be giving this master class tomorrow, so you can ask me questions all the time, anytime, and I'm happy to talk to you. Okay, mm -hmm. that's really, that's really kind. I think that's um, uh, good to realize indeed that Melanie is giving a, uh, a <laughs> workshop tomorrow. Um, maybe we can uh, take a break now. It's a 30 minute break at this moment where, where we can have some lunch. Um, and let's be back here at 12.45 uh, to start with um, Cecile. Um, thanks again, Melanie. Thank you.